Hello Agile loungers and Agile lovers all around the world. How are you today? Friday, November the 27th. We make it 2020. What a year, isn't it? So I am doing this introduction for again the part three of our great conversation with Michael Orman uh, from Enterprise Scrum. He was one of the co-founders of Enterprise Scrum with Mike Beadle and many others, including yours truly, Coach F. And so this is the third installment, and we're going to talk about the open space, of course, because this is the dream come true for my color man, because he see connection from open space to agile to business agility. And we are going to discuss in this segment about the importance of no safe space. We have to confront ideas and to confront each other and to uh, many things. So I'm still on Vivo de Mexico. By the way, uh, we're launching this agile travel. And for you podcaster who run with me on Spotify and Apple and maybe soon on Amazon Prime podcast, I would like to let you know that I will be also your concierge for Yucatan, Chiapas and Campeche for any of your digital nomad needs and uh, even just for leisure. So in the description for the YouTube viewer and the description you could find uh, the way to, to book your free call with us. And so now let's do it. Let's do it, the part three of this great conversation with Michael Orman on open space, business agility, and enterprise problem. Cheers, guys, and have a beautiful day. Excellent. So we have Barbara Michur. She was there. I don't know, Barbara, if you're still there. Say hello to us because I see your art. You just make us a like. So I'm glad you, you make it. So Barbara, she was listening to us at some point. Well, so we're, we're going in the same direction. Yeah. And, um, and this, I fully expect these two boxes to do what my first personal Kanban did, to explode. Exactly. Right? So they blow these up and they say, oh, geez, we've got three different things that we have to do. And we've got these six different kinds of obstacles. Well, look, guys, I wonder if those match up with these things I've gotten, this, you know, these labels on this canvas. Oh, yeah. Well, so now they can see how they do it. Um, you know what I like of your count do, Colin, is actually it will show up right off the bat to the organization. And this is, for me, the true experimentation of business agility, showing like, our team would like to avoid the water scrum fall because if those impediments is because of X department that don't want to change the way they finance our project, for example, or they don't want to um, refactor the way they do testing or what have you, all the cons, I like it that way because this, is, this could even be the assessment of, are you ready to be agile or not? That's well, are you really problem. ready to are you ready to deliver it? I mean, I don't yeah. think it has anything to do with being agile because you're either going to let those stop you, voila, or you're going to produce something. Exactly. Right? So every this is why I, I mean this is the simplified version of there's all the work we do that's our day job that customers think they pay us for. But then I mean, we need a team. Okay. Well, we've got four guys, we need five. So somebody's got to write a job description. Somebody's got to go talk to the boss and get some budget. Somebody's got to set up some interviews. There's there's work. There's stuff to do. So, unless unless you start from scratch with a startup with all new guys who found the company, they should know each other a little bit. Even the well, startup, you know, there's still there's still stuff to do. Yes, they should they know. Never, what to do. There's right. never they they. Unless a group of guys stumbles upon boxes of bananas sitting on the side of the street and they say, guys, let's open these and sell them to, to people who walk by. And, you know, if, if it doesn't happen that easy, they're going to have to go get the bananas. They're going to have to decide which street corner to drop them on. They're going to have to decide how many. There are all kinds of decisions. Then they're going to have to decide who's going to carry them from the car, whose car they're going to drive. There are all kinds of decisions to be made. And those all show up on the board as things we need to consider. Because if it's not as obvious as, hey, here they are, let's sell them and make money, um, then, then they don't have it all worked out. So this then, 
is how I come at this kind of naturally. Incidentally, there's there's another thing that, that we invented along the way in the in the trainings. Um, sometimes looking at the canvas is intimidating, and part of it is they don't know if they want their brains to go into that shape, and that's fair. You know, I bring out a set of clothes and say, "Hey, try these on." You say, "Yeah, well, not my style." You know, so they don't know if it's their style. But yeah. what what we've done? Why don't we create your style? Why don't we create together your style? Yeah. So, well, one of the ways that we've tested this is I say, look, I know this form is pretty good. It, it, there's a lot of stuff been fit into this, um, you know, between Mike's testing and my own experience with it. I feel pretty good about going back to Alex Osterwalder and, and all the people who've used business model canvas. It's a pretty robust story to start with or, or vessel uh, framework to start with. Um, so, I know this, but you know your work. So let's do an experiment. Take the last six months of work. Let's create the done canvas first. I mean, the enterprise scrum, scrum board is a to-do canvas and a little Kanban for the, for the cycle, and then uh, a done canvas, right? So let's populate the done canvas with what you've done the last six months or pick a, you know, pick a time frame. This way they know the work, but they don't know the canvas. Mm -hmm. Now they can learn the canvas with no question about what the work means. What is it? Now, when I say, okay guys, now what do you want to do with the next six months? They don't have to learn the canvas they already did. They're not walking into, geez, what is this canvas and what is our work? How do we add value? Do you have the perception that the, uh, the canvases were meant to be actually enforced into people to make everything visual? Or that was just an aid and they could actually do whatever they want like you just did actually? You, you just did that. Like, uh, yeah, like well, simplifying that. Well, I think, um, well, Mike talked in those earliest days when I was with them in the first uh, enterprise scrum trainings, he was hoping to be able to create software where people could put answers to questions and stuff would show up on canvases. So I think, I think he was pretty committed to the canvas. Um, but I think the fitting, going back to the story I, I told earlier, I think the, the fitting of the canvas the specific shape and you know the, the the rigor of the canvas isn't as important as the making that leap to visualizing exactly because it, it comes back to uh, what mike uh, think and i think since the beginning of uh, trying to help uh, any business of any size is is the people first from even your example you said in the mining tough but even it should always be about our experience as people mm. and making everything visual. Then after all the tool, all the framework, all the literature, all the what have you, it's could be important after if you'd like to leave a trace or to leave a kind of tip because that's a bit like of the cycle of thing, you know? Like uh, I, I like to, to use these uh, analogy of the uh, martial art type of thing, like uh, with your master, the shuhari. Huh? In the mm. shoe moment, you do like the kids on the playground, you experiment things and this stuff. Like, and then you learn that if you do it that certain way, you have certain results. And because you have those results that everybody wants, apparently, just saying, then you will repeat it and you will improve it because you'd like to have may maybe better or smarter results. And then you come to mastering it and teach it to others. So maybe I'm simplifying it, but I think you understand my point. So, mm. so for me, whether it's the canvases from Enterprise Scrum or the uh, these big circle, I don't remember the name from uh, another framework or uh, these big complicated safe things of, uh, you know, organigram or so. So at the end of the day, consultant or not, if, if, if you're 
appeal to a certain audience or certain people. They, want, is they are just tools. Because as you said, could we right. get the S done? That's the important thing. So for me, this is why more and more, Michael, I, I try to stay away, and I don't mind to say it, apply here to anyone who will for any markets. This is why I, stay, I try to stay away from these big corporate toxic politics that just want to have tools and buzzword and mm. certification and apparent expertise of doing things because they don't move. They will hide themselves into those canvases actually or anything. And it became just toxic politics instead of doing things that brings value to their well, clients, for example. You can, you know, in that same way, um, the other story I tell about these different methods is that I know that if we write an invitation inside, especially inside of an organization where people care so much because they're working on stuff every day, it's not mm -hmm. some community thing. It's not a conference, but if you do open space inside of an organization and you say, we're going to talk about the future of the organization and you're welcome to come and learn and contribute in that people will come. Yes. And when you set the chairs up and you say, okay, we don't have a, an agenda, you do this in open space and you say anything that you think matters to the future of this company, you write it on the paper and put it on the wall. You will identify all the issues that matter. You will get them addressed in breakout conversations to the extent that anybody in the room knows how to do that at that moment. You can take the notes, you can ask them to take notes and they will. And then you can share the notes around, you can prioritize those and create action plans, immediate next steps for those um, uh, issues. Now, a lot of times, the thing to do is to go back to the office and go back to work the way we always uh, have worked. But if you leave all that stuff up and start moving it, you know, prior, you know, you prioritize a bit, and which is natural, I would maintain, and you move that over, to a, another panel of the wall. And then when you finish things, you move them over, you can easily invent Kanban. Now, if you have to do some more refining, if you need to, you know, somebody walks up to the wall and says, hey, this thing here, when is it gonna get done? Well, most simple Kanbans can't answer that question. Yeah. Unless you've gotten really into the analysis there, but. Otherwise, I think that just sort of leads you into Scrum, where you start to, you know, look at velocity and look at the, the effort it's going to take, the complexity um, of things and, and what it's going to take to come over that, how fast you're chewing through this pile. And you're going to have to invent Scrum out of your Kanban. And then if you do that with very many teams and you have very big things going on, working on the same thing, you're scaling or you're, you're connecting multiple teams, you're gonna have to invent enterprise scrum anyway. So all of that naturally happens. Yeah. And the proof that open space and, and that whole journey to, to enterprise scrum is possible was, was made for me when I worked with a, a community art center it's called the Art Barn, Michigan City, Indiana. I volunteered to, to open a space on a, a Sunday because my mom is a watercolor artist and they needed some help. And I said, sure, I'll do this. So we worked in open space for a few hours, a couple hours, two, three hours. And then I gave them 20 minutes to take everything that was on their flip charts and put it in the canvas. And by God, they did it just like that. Now they might, it, it might've been a, a stack deck, so to speak, because they were, they were artists. They're used to doing their stuff and putting it on the wall. So maybe the mind was already ready to put stuff on the wall, but no matter, they didn't know anything about scrum and combat, you know, like, but they managed to put that stuff up. They could prioritize in the boxes and they took it and they put it in a spreadsheet and that's how they ran the next uh, three, six, nine months of their, you know, turning the place around. But that, that, then I don't know what happened after that, but. You don't know what happened after that, but. Um... I mean, they're still there, but they, I mean, that, I mean, they, they had only talked about what, I mean, the open space was, let's get our act together in the next six months. 
there was a trigger uh, of what you said before, like uh, we create an open space and we invite everybody and they will come. Okay. What about those people who are not necessarily less creative, but they feel they're not that outgoing. They are more introvert. What do you do? Is it like, because it's an open space. It's a, it's not an issue. It's it not an look, issue? Tell me. No, because it, on the one hand, the people always start with, well, what about the intro? There's a big circle and people have to announce things. And then they're, they're, everybody is moving around and it looks like a big party and the introverts would get lost. But I would, I mean, other than being an introvert, very strong introvert, I should say, and um, not really worrying about the extroverts because they always seem to take care of themselves. Um, so the introverts never ask this question. How do you identify introvert, extrovert? Me? Yeah. Oh, identify as uh, as a whole being, so I don't know. Yeah, okay, okay. Yes, no, but truly, but, so if we all did that, then your question goes poof. But so that for the sake uh, of your question. For the sake of my question, I will say mostly, uh, as I told, like, uh, I, I'm too loud, apparently. So, so probably if I'm too loud, I'm probably extrovert. You're probably an extrovert. But I feel the need another space. round for everybody. Okay. okay. So well, here's the thing. That's a great, it's a great question because it's extroverts looking out for the introverts. The introverts never ask, hey, what about the, you know, we all go into the center of the circle and say, this is my burning passion. This is the most important thing to me. And I'd like to talk to a few of you who share this passion. And then the people who gather, I know they only came to talk about the issue that I posted. They're going to go deep into it with me. And I don't know what these extroverts do because they always just want to go around and buy another round of drinks and talk to everybody a little bit and find out what's going on at the next party. They never you know, want to go deep and, and really think deeply and feel deeply and you know all that, whatever. And um, how are they going to work in this open space setting where only the most important stuff is what we need to, to dive deep into? There's, so there's something for everybody in it. Okay, but again, I don't want to put like the temperament into it, but like uh, because I struggle often as a consultant to enable people and those who are less too loud uh, seems to, to be harder to get and through this kind of creative process of making everything visual and transparent. I, I'm not saying like they want to hide or that's not what I'm saying, but I mean, uh, at some yeah, point. I've never found the, the oh? when you when you make the currency in open space, you make the currency caring. Oh. And nobody, you know, caring, you got different ways to express it, but everybody cares. So we're back to whole people. When Mike built this canvas uh, adapted from the uh, business model canvas, he put purpose at the top. Now, Everybody's working on that. So introvert, extrovert, doesn't matter. Purposeful. The Emory, Emory and Trist in, in the coal mines and all that. And as they used said, to say, they, they, they said all of that participative design work um, ran on two assumptions. People are purposeful and can be ideal seeking. Those two things, if you grant me those two things, open space and enterprise scrum and everything in between is completely normal, explainable, natural, because people care about a purpose and you don't need to agree with their purpose, but they've got it and they care about it and they're going to chase it. So, so the force is a flow of letting go of what we learn together. Hmm. Is it? Yeah. Because when I, when I hear you explaining this, from the open space to enterprise scrum and anything in between. For me, it's like the flow of a river through the ocean. Now, I really, that's the way I feel it. I'm not thinking it. I'm just like, I'm feeling it. The water is always the water. If I play, if I pick up on this, um, there's always the water. The, the shapes, you know, it, it gets deep, it gets narrow, it gets wide and flat and shallow and slow. It's a different experience in different places, but the water is always the water, the purpose, the caring, the people, it's always 
there's always a, a movement and energy. I mean, this VUCA, this stuff comes because people are always moving. Minds are always yeah. moving and, and things. So yeah, th that's the water. And then we, we run it through these containers all the way into, you know, glasses. I didn't bring beer. I, I'm bad. <laughs> I drink water. We have, I've got both. But actually, you know, again, water is everywhere. It's 70% of our planet, of our body. And, and beer, there's water. It is. You add a couple of things and you let fermented it for the alcohol. But... I, I guess I'm a purist. <laughs> But the story I was telling just a minute ago would, would say otherwise. I don't know. I guess I'm a whole person, as you say. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, because for me, uh, the, the identification of uh, are you this, are you that? No, uh, of course, we have enough in, uh, in kind of uh, helping people. You try to see, to adapt yourself or your style of coaching, for example, or stuff. So, so for me, is uh, an open space. Uh, I had to have that question because whether we do sometimes... You will never satisfy everybody, right? So I was questioning more. It was it like, how do you actually make sure that that space will be for everyone? Because the, yeah. the extrovert, the, the 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 standard extrovert, loud mouth could take too much space. So for me, as a facilitator, and people I try, walk away. You, people walk that's away. The thing. That's the thing. And, so, and and they do and they do what they need to do in their way down the hall in another it, it and. Part of this is but I, I, one answer to your question is you can't. You can't take care of it. We asked, this was, I always remember the open space on open space four. The, the fourth one we did, this was 1996. And, uh, you know, we still get together, but a lot of open space people get together every, every year and talk about open space. You know, we eat our own dog food, as they say. And uh, so we did this and somebody put up a topic and said, uh, is, the question was, is open space safe space? Mm -hmm. And it was about creating safe space and who does that? And one of the, the, the main conclusion as I remember it is that if the universe is, you know, going back to the Einstein thought, uh, you know, if, if the universe is, is cruel, then everything is dangerous, including open space. Yeah, and if we like, live in a benevolent universe, life, life experience itself, here in this dimension, it's dangerous. Everything we, is sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's lions and tigers and, you yeah. know, guys on the corner selling bananas and who knows where they came from. Actually, and this is why apparently we become civilized because we try to, to construct a bubble and control and Right. Exactly. Well, that's that's <laughs> pretty true. Yeah, I, I got to agree with that. And, and safer, yet, safer and safer, and sometimes safe. You can't. You, you lose your. How limit. do you decide? Like, yeah, that's the free there, will. Yeah. You know, but the the conclusion that that always stuck with me was: if people think the world is safe, then they're going to think open space is safe. And if they think the world is dangerous for whatever reason, lions and tigers or the guy in the cube next to you who bullies you with paper clips and, you know, yeah. whatever stickies on your back or something, you know, whatever. If, if there, if there are jerks in the office, they're going to be jerks in open space. If you, if you get together and talk about the future of the company. So you can't, in some ways, if taking the organizational context, for instance, if we get open space together in open space, I think it's unreasonable to expect that anybody coming in as a facilitator or the boss or anybody else who would open and hold that space, it's unreasonable to hold them to a higher standard than we do every day. It can only be the world we live in. It's not separate from, it's not rarefied. It's just true. It's just real. And if the, if the office is a, cutthroat place then open space about the office is going to be cutthroat until people choose the potential of somebody putting it up and saying um hey is there another way other than cutthroat office i mean we had a, a in an open space once we had a false choice created because they had a keynote speaker who talked about an issue that some people cared about and the other people were 
I mean, it was, is a food healthy or emergency food and homeless and, and soup kitchens and stuff. And he talked a lot about um, uh, organics and stuff like that, healthy food. And so there was this division created in the group artificially. And somebody put up the topic the next day of the, the beginning of the day said, do hungry people care if, if it's healthy question and started to cut through the that false dichotomy. So people can raise issues like that in a way that cuts through that space if they want, when they dare. Um, and, and, so. and people just show up in the open space. Yeah. That's it. I mean, like it's open. It's open for anyone who wants. To. Well, I mean, you convene, I mean, you say, look, we're gonna, um, we're going to, have this meeting. We've got 150 people we're inviting who said they, you know, signed up, said they're going to come. We're going to talk about the future of the business or whatever, some smaller topic. Um, you could have all the potential stakeholders. Well, heck, there's a there was a group that used to do industrial design. I mean, they built software mm -hmm. that auto companies and Deer and Caterpillar used to build heavy equipment. My my buddy there um, used to say. We, we design design. They, they say, what we're, we're inventing what the human mind can then use to make things that come into the world. So they were designing design and they used to have, he was the vice president of space. He was the vice president, eventually he was organization development, then strategic planning, then space was his portfolio. And he was the vice president of strategic planning and customer excellence. And he used to have an annual open space. They brought people in, a handful of people from their 13 or so largest clients. They did an open space with that. So it was, would have been a group of 50 or 60 people maybe. And they identified, they, it was customers plus some people from the company, right? And oh. it was basically a stakeholder conference. Every year, their biggest customers designed what they wanted to see delivered a year from now. So well, they didn't have to sell any of that. They only had to build it. So, so you can get that together. And yeah, people show up and then they, they start writing stuff that they want to see and, and working out that they worked out all the specs. I mean. So, so that means that the people interaction is fully open. And well, as open as the people choose. As the people moment do, to moment. as you said, like it will reflect the actual organization culture and so on. But we'll, you, you see, like big corporation, often they will do this kind of town hall, where only a couple of stakeholders. I know, I know, that, that's the thing. So, so you will say like <laughs> and the plan new, the scripts for months and yes, yeah, yeah. But there's no interaction there because you just right. receive information and you receive exactly what you're gonna do into your department and this and that. Yep. So actually, if we would like to really change the world of work, instead of just talking about it, we should use open space at least once a year and create a vision altogether for those who do and those who actually, they said they we use it. We use it every, we can use it every day, right? It, um, yeah, but I mean, yeah, you, it, it, it doesn't, it, because, it, because it doesn't need to be the big event, right? Yeah. The, the big event of 140 people from all over the world with the CEO and the rest of the C-suite and all that stuff, that's one thing that can happen, right? Okay. But that's like the enterprise scrum map with, with all the teams linked together, you know, like Mike's vision. Yeah. But nobody starts out there and you don't have to, right? I did an open space on a project team because we had a project meeting every week and the project manager was always invited. Uh, or, or the boss of the project manager was always invited. So we worked out the agenda. I mean, there were like five people gathering, but the, the boss could come. So we had to have the typed agenda and we had to work out the whole agenda for about two days out of every week. And then it got printed up and everybody got passed out at the beginning of the meeting and the project manager would run the meeting and if the boss walked in, it would all be perfect. And we would be right on where we were supposed to be. 
And we went on like that for a couple of months. And then we got to the place where the project manager asked us how we were, how we were doing. And it was a relatively short project, about halfway through. And none of us working on the project knew how we were going to get out of this thing alive because we weren't getting anywhere. All we were doing was making agendas. Did, so did, yeah, did I, I said, when she asked, how's it going in this little, you know, what some people would call a come to Jesus meeting. Um, the, uh, I said, you know, I wish just one, one of these weekly project team meetings, we could just make a list on the whiteboard of everything we need to do in order to get done. <laughs> just one of these boxes, right? Just, just by one box. Um, make the list of everything we need to do to get this done right by the time we, we said we're going to finish. And everything that other people said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Everything, everything that will prevent us because your second column. Is I didn't even, I didn't even ask the second question. No, Just honey. what do we need to do? Simplest backlog question possible, right? Yeah. To a group of five people plus the manager, maybe. And so I said, could we just make that list? And okay. she let us do that because the team was kind of fed up with it. Yeah, yeah, let's do, let's just do that because they, you know, it was a little, little pushback. So we did that. Now we put eight things up. We talked about two of them, right? Or three of them. The next week we got back together and we had a typed agenda again. But you know what? It looked exactly like what was on the wall. And we talked about it some more. And we went along and chewed through those things and got it done on time, on budget, on the mark. So that was a tiny bit of open space that opened and then it went boop, closed and got owned the same way it always did. But it, the river kept leaking through. It, 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 we just put the river in a pipe and put mm. it underground, but it kept flowing and we got done with it. But that's the thing, like I, I see it often and do all, any type of group that become a real team that want to achieve something, this is what they do. Mm. And a lot of people from the outside will say like, oh, these guys are oversimplifying things. I said like, really? Is it not the purpose? We talked about the VUCA, volatility and complexity. Why? W what do you want to hide behind your complexity, behind your processes, behind your procedure that become our list of impediment actually? Mm. If you let them do with self-organize and self-manage what they are there to do with their skills and competency they will achieve it. But if you put them into a box of any type of uh, structure and procedure, you're killing the creativity and the possibility of doing the things that are important for all the yeah. stakeholders at some point. But question here. Yeah. It's really, really fun and open space. We're open, we're more creative and we get the shit done probably faster because it's visual and and so on, but I have a but. I, I, I usually not going into the but, but just for the purpose of the discussion, I like to, because I could hear Start people. Up, baby. Yeah. What about the consensus? Do we have to be consensual and uh, abiding to a, a kind of a group I mindset or we could still allow a type of a free will or a type <laughs> of a kind of a out of the box inside that out of the box type of thing? Well, it's another, you know I, mean? I think the, I think the question implies another kind of container. Another, another it's just one? another consensus. It's just another container because That's, what if we, whether we get consensus or we don't, is it when we say that, is it on everything? Is it on some things? Does it include what should we get on the pizzas for lunch on Friday? Um, you know, yeah, we work in perfect consensus until we got to order the pizzas and then it's free for all. <laughs> right. But I know. Um, well, because so, it doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Whether we achieve that doesn't matter. What matters is that, go, go back to the manifesto, the people in any, the interactions, if they're talking to each other. Exactly. I mean, Marilyn Emery, who, Fred Emery's wife, who taught me this participative design, she, um, pe people asked her about using this, these methods at, uh, I think it was, uh, well, I won't say the name of the company in case I got it wrong, but there was a company that was raised by name in the, in the training. And 
The problem was, well, what if I do it there where they've done, they've created stuff um, for torture. They're, they're creating tools for torture. And she looked at this person and Marilyn is, stands about four, 10, but she's just a giant energy and uh, 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 just a firecracker. And she looked with, with it grew up in the outback or something. I mean, she was just, she was tough. And she says, she, she turned on the person and said, how are they going to change if we won't work with them? <laughs> I said, You're right. Yeah. How, unless we see something different. So as long as people are talking about this stuff, as long as they have to put all their stuff on the wall together, because there's one wall, they, if there's two then, walls, they don't have to talk to each other. With the conversation and interaction, we could actually kind of- Something will happen. Flowing. Because what I uh, sometimes, uh, and just want to stick into the open space, but any kind of gathering of people try to work together. When you have someone in the room start saying like uh when and should we agree agree on what we should ag we should agree that everybody should put up their topic well here's the other thing people say oh you sit in the circle in open space that's because everybody is equal and exactly. i always push back i say no the people are all still very different they mm -hmm. all come they have different preferences they have different experiences different tools and skills but they all have the same job. Everybody has to learn and contribute as much as they can. And everybody has to figure out what that means for themselves. Only they know, and only they can push that edge. That's their personal expedition, but we can all travel that so, same so journey. A lot of people think that because they are in a circle is because everyone is equal. Yeah. They have equal access. We set the markers in the center and everybody has equal access to the tools. Mm -hmm. Everybody has equal access to the wall. So, but everybody's got the same challenge as a human. To where can I learn and contribute? And so they, they go down that road. But, um, you know, until, until you start putting stuff up and, you know, hanging out your laundry, um, then everything can stay inside. Mm -hmm.